This is the story of Princess Ka'iulani of Hawaii. It's a story of hope and betrayal, of deception and revolution, of surfing and painting and dancing, and of incredible tenacity and bravery. Ka'iulani spent her childhood in Hawaii, but almost all of her adolescence in Europe, where she left one royal mystery that has yet to be solved. Maybe one of you will have the answer. From the beaches of Waikiki, to the sun-drenched French Riviera, to the ballrooms of Wiesbaden, this story will take us from the heart of an independent kingdom to the capitals of European power. We're going to watch history unfold through the eyes of a girl who was the hope of her nation and witness to a stunning tragedy that too few of us know about today. In terms of this story, I'm just another Haole, an outsider, a foreigner. But as with all the women I research for this channel, what started out as curiosity became something more. I fell in love with Ka'iulani's dignity, strength, and sense of duty. As we're about to find out, she has something to teach all of us about how to fight for what matters. Archibald Scott Cleghorn, whom I'm going to call Archie, was a Scottish-born businessman who lived in Hawaii. He'd sailed to Oahu at the age of 15 with his family and stayed to run the family dry goods business after his father died. He fell in love with a Hawaiian woman named Elizabeth Pauahi Lapeka. Information on her is scarce, but it seems they spent years together, most likely in a common law marriage. They had three daughters, all of whom he adopted when he and Elizabeth went their separate ways in 1868. As a successful businessman, Archie met and mingled with Honolulu's high society. At a prestigious men's club, he met David Kalakaua, the future king of Hawaii. Kalakaua's family was descended from a first cousin of King Kamehameha I, also known as Kamehameha the Great. Kalakaua and his siblings were ali'i, or Hawaiian nobles descended from a high-ranking, chiefly family. In his family, there were four siblings in total. David Kalakaua, William Pitt Leleohoku, Lydia Liliu Kamakaeha, and Miriam Likelike. David Kalakaua introduced 33-year-old Archie to his youngest sister, the beautiful 17-year-old Likelike. Archie fell for her right away, and no wonder. Likelike was vivacious, flirtatious, charming, and engaged. Her fiancé was another ali'i of royal blood, an illegitimate son of King Kamehameha III, but Archie didn't let that stop him. And sometime in mid to late 1869, Like Like and her fiancé broke off their engagement. Two years after falling for her, Archie finally convinced Like Like to marry him. They said I do in 1870, but unfortunately, their married life wasn't a walk in the park. Unlike the European royal families I've covered on this channel, the Hawaiian royal family had no restrictions about marrying what their European counterparts would have called commoners. While the king had married a Hawaiian noblewoman, both of his sisters, Lili'u and Like Like, married white men. That clash of cultures made life more difficult for both women. In Archie and Like Like's case, their relationship was probably a case of opposites attract. Archie was dependable, dignified, and steady. Like Like, on the other hand, was a social butterfly and, I suspect, a girly girl. Her favorite color was light blue, and she loved ordering new dresses from Paris and San Francisco. At parties and balls, while wearing her new couture, she had flowers in her hair so she left a hint of fragrance as she walked by. And speaking of parties, she was an excellent hostess who loved to entertain. When she discovered croquet, for example, she turned it into a trend by hosting frequent croquet parties for her friends. But she also had a temper. One of her daughter's governesses would later describe her as having, quote, an imperious and impulsive nature and is considered quite haughty by some, but she is very genial in her home and is always most thoughtful and considerate of those she likes. An example of that consideration? She adopted Archie's three daughters from his previous relationship so the girls would be considered her children, too. The problem was that both Archie and Like Like tried to wear the pants in their relationship. Like Like was an ali'i and used to getting her own way. In Hawaiian society, she outranked Archie hands down. 
but Archie was Scottish, the product of a white European family and upbringing. And this was not a time when women were allowed to make the rules, socially or politically. It's not surprising that Archie and Like Like clashed occasionally. But because of their temperaments, those clashes could turn into big drama. Sometimes, during a fight, Like Like would retreat to the big island of Hawaii, where she'd grown up and still liked to visit. One time, Archie wrote to her there and ordered her to come home right away because people were gossiping about them, but Like Like could not be told what to do. She replied with this, quote, Don't listen to rumors of my misbehaving. I cannot do a single thing but what the natives misconstrue my actions. Of course, this only made Archie more upset, ordering her once more to come home and to stop drinking wine. Apparently, what happened in Hawaii doesn't stay in Hawaii. This isn't the only hint of Like Like's scandalous or flirtatious behavior. I probably shouldn't even mention this story, because I don't think it's true. But in the spirit of full disclosure, I'll tell you so you have the full picture. According to one source, and only one source that I've found so far, with no citation for this story, Like Like's flirtations might have gotten physical with Colonel James Boyd. Author Helena G. Allen claims that Like Like and Boyd shared a passionate embrace and kiss goodbye while she was on a trip to the Boyd Ranch with her sister Lili'u. When Lili'u looked back at the killer view, she saw their private moment and couldn't get the romantic scene out of her head. According to Allen, Like Like's romantic moment became the inspiration for Aloha Oe, Lili'u's most famous song. Don't take that as gospel, however. There seems to be more evidence that the embrace involved someone else entirely, and that when it happened, Like Like was pissed that Boyd was holding up their departure. In 1874, four years after Like Like married Archie, her brother became the king of Hawaii. We'll talk about how that happened later, but I don't want to get into politics just yet. We're still meeting all the characters in our story. So now, Like Like was a princess third in line for the throne after her two older siblings, both of whom had no heirs. But in the following year, Like Like began to make fewer and fewer appearances. She's barely mentioned in the newspapers in the spring of 1875. That was because, after five years of marriage, Like Like was pregnant. On October 16, 1875, Like Like gave birth to a baby girl. They named her Victoria Kawikiyu Keiulani Lunalilo Kalaninui Ahila Palapa. You'll see the order of those names appear differently in different sources. I've seen it at least six different ways. Interestingly, the order of her names isn't even the same in her father's diary and her father's birthday book. And the last of those names isn't listed in her father's diary entry for the day she was born. Her parents chose the name Victoria to honor the granddaughter of King Kamehameha I and former Crown Princess of Hawaii, Victoria Kamamalu, who had in turn been named after Queen Victoria. But within the family, she was called Ke'iulani. And from the moment she arrived, she was special. It had been almost 20 years since a royal baby had been born in the direct line of succession. Because the king had no legitimate children, his younger brother was his heir, but he wasn't married yet, let alone a father. Their sister Lili'u was next in line for the throne, but because she and her husband also had no children, the next heirs were Like Like and, now, Ke'iulani. Her aunt Lili'u later wrote, quote, She was at once recognized as the hope of the Hawaiian people, as the only direct heir by birth to the throne. The hope of an entire people. <laughs> no pressure, right? Ke'iulani was christened by the Anglican Bishop of Honolulu on Christmas Day in St. Andrew's Cathedral. Wrapped in a cashmere blanket, she didn't cry at all, which surprised everyone, and boded well for the future. As godparents, Archie and Like Like had chosen the king and queen, as well as Princess Ruth Ke'elikolani, one of the last senior members of the Kamehameha dynasty. Before she turned two, Ke'iulani took another step closer to the throne. On April 10, 1877, her uncle, William Pitt Leleohoku, died. Her aunt Lili'u 
was now next in line for the throne, followed by her mother, and then herself. When Ke'iulani was three, her dad sold the house she'd been born in and moved the family out to Waikiki. In those days, Waikiki was a beach retreat, a four-mile carriage ride from the city center. Her godmother Ruth had given her property there, and her dad bought an additional beachfront plot to create a 10-acre estate where he built their new house. Like Like named it Aina Hau, Hawaiian for the cool place, thanks to the refreshing breeze that swept down from the mountains. Ke'iulani grew up steps from the beach and the gorgeous blue waters of the tropical Pacific. Her dad gave her a white pony named Fairy, and by the time she was seven, she was often seen riding around Waikiki with a groom following her to keep her safe. She also learned how to surf, swim, and paddle an outrigger canoe. Archie created a spectacular garden that included the island's first banyan tree, which his father had brought to Hawaii from India. There were also 300 coconut palms, mango trees, date palms, cinnamon trees, teak trees, Monterey cypress, hibiscus, lily ponds, and Ke'iulani's favorite flower, Chinese jasmine. He added a giant tortoise and peacocks, which Ke'iulani fell in love with. She taught them to eat out of her hand, resulting in her nickname of the Peacock Princess. The enormous banyan tree provided shade and a place for Ke'iulani and her friends to play. There, with her half-sister Annie, she learned to dance the hula, sing, and play the ukulele. The Hawaiian royal family was incredibly talented when it came to music, songs, and poetry. Ke'iulani's uncle, the king, wrote the lyrics for the national anthem, Hawaii Ponoi. As we mentioned, her aunt Lili'u composed Aloha Oe, one of the most famous Hawaiian songs of all time. If you've seen the Disney movie Lilo and Stitch, or the Elvis movie Blue Hawaii, you've heard this song. And that was just one of over 200 songs Lili'u wrote in her lifetime. Ke'iulani's mom, Like Like, composed songs too. In fact, along with their deceased brother, William Pitt Lileo Hoku, these four siblings were referred to as Nilani Eha, or the Heavenly Four, for their musical abilities and efforts to support Hawaiian culture. The family's musical spirit added to the magic of Aina Hao. On Sunday afternoons, friends and family gathered to relax, sing, and play music. In addition to the king, frequent guests included the only other royal children near Ke'iulani in age. These were the three sons of Queen Kapi'ulani's sister, David Kawananakoa, Edward Abel Kili'iahonui, and Jonah Kuhiu Kalaniana'ole. When the boy's mother died, two of them, Kawananakoa, and Kalania Na'ole became Hanai sons to the queen. You may see the word Hanai referred to as adoption or fostering, but those are English words that the early missionaries to Hawaii used to describe something they had no equivalent for and no understanding of when they first encountered it. At birth, it was the custom for Ali'i parents to give their child to a relative or friend. A child given in Hanai was considered the new parent's child as much as any of their natural children. Hanai had practical benefits, like strengthening relationships between family groups. In Ali'i families, it could also give that child a higher rank and station in life. It was part of the spirit of selfless love and togetherness represented by the word aloha, giving, sharing, supporting, and loving the people in your family and your community. I'm telling you all this because one of those boys will play a major role in Ke'iulani's story and he's often referred to as her cousin. But the cousin label comes from the fact that he was a Hanai son to her aunt by marriage. There is a distant relationship there, but it's not nearly as close as the word cousin implies to us today. If it sounds like her upbringing had everything to do with her mom's side of the family and none of her dad's, that's not quite true. Archie's three daughters were close members of the family, and the youngest, Annie, was Ke'iulani's best friend. Archie also took steps to teach her about money and business. When the social club he belonged to incorporated in Honolulu, he bought his seven-year-old daughter two shares and explained what it meant to hold stock. Money wasn't a problem yet, but it would become one in the future. Ke'iulani figured out she was different at a very young age. When a friend got in trouble for sitting on her bed, 
Her nurse told her it was because she was a princess and her friend wasn't. Is it very nice to be a princess? Ke'iulani asked. And the nurse told her it was the nicest thing in the world, except for being a queen. And from that moment, as she later told a reporter, Ke'iulani always wanted to be a queen. Ke'iulani later described herself at this age as, quote, naturally naughty. Part of that naughtiness came from the knowledge that she was a princess. She was raised with the certainty that others would be punished if they touched her or took her things. Through the tales of old Hawaii, she learned that people used to be killed if they stepped into the shadow of royalty. Hawaiians believed the ali'i were literal descendants of the gods. It's no wonder there were a few tantrums when she couldn't have her way. Luckily, her governess found the right question to get through to her. If you never obey any authority, how can you expect others to obey you someday? It was the exact right question to ask because it tied together the concept of royalty and duty. As we'll see, those two concepts became intertwined and ingrained in Ke'iulani for the rest of her life. Because even as a little girl, she had social obligations as a member of the royal family. She went on trips, including one with her aunt Lili'u, on a tour of state around Oahu, where she saw friends and subjects pay their respects. When she had to attend a special event or go see an important visitor in Honolulu, she used her mother's state carriage made of tortoise shell with gilt harnesses for the horses. Every single aspect of her life reinforced the idea that she was special and that she had a role to play in her family and in her country. Imagine how this shapes your goals, your image, and your sense of self-worth. Imagine growing up 110% secure in your purpose and your place in life, and then imagine what happens when all of that comes crumbling down around you. But there's one more influence I want to tell you about. It was a side of her mother we haven't seen yet, a dark, dramatic, fatalistic side. In 1883, Like Like and Archie had yet another fight, and she went to the Big Island to get away. From there, Like Like wrote him a disturbing letter, quote, You always blame me in everything, and I'm getting tired of it. I will have to kill myself, then you won't have me to growl at all the time. I think we are better separated, as you don't love me, and I don't love you. Yikes, right? And as we'll see later, Ke'iulani also inherited some of this darkness, this fatalism. Eighteen eighty-six, the year Ke'iulani was eleven, turned out to be a terrible year for their family. That spring, Archie's business failed. A recession in the United States had caused the price of sugar to fall. Low prices hurt the Hawaiian sugar planters, who were Archie's main clientele. Wealthy businessman Theophilus Davies, a fellow Brit and good friend, helped Archie liquidate his assets and pay off his debts. As we'll see, Davies is going to play a huge role in Ke'iulani's life. Then, in late April, her mother had a miscarriage. And although she recovered physically, it seems that there was something broken inside her. She made her regular appearances at court functions, including Ke'iulani's 11th birthday celebration in October. There. In front of 200 guests, the king proposed a toast to Ke'iulani and Like Like. It should have been a perfect family moment, a harbinger of good things to come. Instead, it was the last birthday Ke'iulani would ever share with both her parents. That December, Princess Like Like began acting strangely. Instead of being her usual outgoing self, she could hardly get out of bed and refused to eat. Because the change was sudden and seemingly without a cause, superstitious gossip said that someone was using ancient magic to make her sick, to pray her to death. Her doctors came and went, but nobody was able to identify, let alone treat, Like Like's condition. They told Archie that physically, there didn't seem to be anything wrong with her. So Archie made plans to send both Like Like and Ke'iulani to Monterey, California in the spring hoping the change of scenery and climate would help. On January 13th, Like Like turned 36. In any other year, she would have had a big party, but not this one. Her sister, Lili'u, wrote in her diary, quote, Sister is 36 years old today. 
and is not strong. When the volcano of Mauna Loa erupted on the island of Hawaii on January 16, 1887, it wasn't a good omen. To those who still believed in the old ways, it meant the volcano goddess Pele was angry. Like Like believed the eruption had something to do with her, even though her sister called this belief, quote, a piece of superstition. The king's prime minister wrote in his diary, quote, the princess Like Like is said to be in danger, refuses food, affected by her native superstition that her death is required by the spirit of Pele of the volcano. The king is angry with his sister on account of her obstinacy in refusing food. Another bad omen was the report of a school of red aweoweo fish off the island of Hawaii, where Like Like had once served as governess. Their appearance was believed to be a sign that an ali'i was about to die. Her family called in two more doctors, but they couldn't help. On the afternoon of February 2nd, 1887, Ke'iulani was told that it was time to say a last goodbye. Afterward, she tearfully told her governess about her mother's last words to her. Like Like had said that Ke'iulani would leave Hawaii for a long time, that she would never marry, and she would never be queen. According to one source, Like Like's last words to her sister were, Ke'iulani must not marry one she does not love. At about 4.45 p.m. that afternoon, Like Like died. The newspapers, unsure what to say about her death, described it as a heart attack, exhaustion, or just the product of her delicate health. As Hawaiian protocol for the death of an ali'i dictated, the body could only be moved after midnight. Ke'iulani accompanied her mother's body to Iolani Palace by a torchlight procession. They arrived at the palace shortly after 3 a.m. She would remain there with her mother's body as it lay in state for three weeks until the funeral. At the palace, when she saw her mother dressed and laid out on the bier, she said she screamed once and then couldn't find a voice to cry or scream again. Later, Ke'iulani said, quote, I idolized my mother. She was charming, very brilliant, very happy and sunny. We worshipped each other and I have missed her every day from the first dreadful day she died. After the initial shock of her mother's death had passed, court gossip began to hint that the king, Like Like's own brother, had been the one who prayed her to death. She had been a sacrifice required to retain his shaky hold on the throne. This was probably the first time in her life that Hawaii's deteriorating political situation hit home for 11-year-old Ke'iulani. It would control virtually everything about the rest of her life, beginning with defining her relationship to her remaining parent. After Like Like's death, the Minister of the Interior, a lawyer named Lauren Thurston, forced Archie to go to court to become Ke'iulani's legal guardian. And if that sounds like a jerk move, I agree. Unfortunately, we need to remember that name because Lauren Thurston is about to play a major role in our story. And from Ke'iulani's perspective, that role is the villain. To explain why, in a more comprehensive fashion than just calling him a jerk, we're gonna have to take a step backward in time. In 1795, the king of the island of Hawaii, Kamehameha, set out to conquer the other islands in the Hawaiian archipelago. He was a military genius who harnessed elements of Western technology, like guns and compasses, and used them to his advantage. Within 15 years, he had full control over the newly established Kingdom of Hawaii. When he died in 1819, he was succeeded by his son as Kamehameha II. Up to this point, Hawaiian society had been governed by a strict system of rules called kapu, or taboo. If you violated kapu, you were punished, not only by man, but by the Hawaiian gods. Kapu had particularly restrictive rules for women. Men and women couldn't eat together, for example, and certain foods were off-limits to women, including pork, bananas, and coconuts. Not all of the kapu were bad, however, like the rules that focused on responsible farming and water usage. But sometimes, Hawaiians violated kapu, and nothing happened. 
And then when Western visitors arrived and violated Kapu without any cosmic punishment, it provided the opening that two very ambitious women had been waiting for. Kamehameha I's favorite wife, Ka'ahumanu, had already decided the Kapu system had to go. With the help of the new king's mother, she prodded Kamehameha II to abolish the Kapu system in November of 1819, just months after his father's death. He followed this up with an order to burn all the idols and destroy all the temples. There was no going back now. In one of the greatest historical coincidences ever, just four months later, a group of Congregationalist missionaries from Boston, Massachusetts arrived with the goal of converting Hawaiians to Christianity. So now we have a culture suddenly cut loose from the traditional rules that underpinned its entire social and behavioral code and a group of people who, out of the blue, show up with a new one. The missionaries brought with them Western names, clothes, technology, and medicine. Both of the powerful women who had helped break the kapu system accepted medical care from the missionaries and eventually accepted their religion too. Their conversion led the way for other Hawaiians of noble and royal blood, whose example trickled down and inspired many of their subjects to do the same. Unfortunately, the more Western visitors Hawaii received, the more Western diseases decimated the population. Hawaiians had no previous exposure, and thus no natural immunity or antibodies, to diseases like measles, whooping cough, influenza, smallpox, and venereal disease, which often resulted in infertility. Before Europeans arrived, the islands had an estimated population of anywhere from 300,000 to 1 million. But by 1836, that number was down to about 107,000 Native Hawaiians. Almost 20 years later, that number was down to about 73,000. But the biggest and most controversial changes were yet to come. King Kamehameha II's brother, who ruled as Kamehameha III, decided to turn his absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy like the one Great Britain had under Queen Victoria. But to do that, Hawaii needed all the trappings of Western government, a constitution, a legislature, a supreme court, and well-defined voting rights for Native Hawaiian men. So he made all of that happen. Then, under pressure from white settlers, he instituted a sweeping land reform called the Mihele, which converted Hawaii's system of communal land use into one based on private property. But up to this point, there was no word in the Hawaiian language for privately owned land, because there was no such concept. For their entire history, the Ali'i had been in charge of seeing to their people's needs and making sure no one went hungry. The concept of aloha meant that you gave what you had, and if you had nothing, you gave of yourself. Everyone helped everyone, and neither money nor material possessions were part of their value system. How could a piece of paper change that? The government did a terrible job explaining this new concept, so many native Hawaiians were either unable to claim land, or claimed it, and later sold it, not understanding what selling meant. But of course the American and European settlers understood these systems. They swooped in and bought as much land as they could, through fair means and foul, with the intent of starting businesses and sugar plantations. By the 1890s, a handful of white planters controlled four-fifths of Hawaii's arable land. As his next step, King Kamehameha III sent representatives to other countries, requesting recognition for Hawaii as a sovereign nation. Great Britain, France, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, Italy, Russia, Portugal, Japan, and the U.S., among others, recognized Hawaii as independent. But from the get-go, some Americans were already thinking about how to make some, or all, of Hawaii theirs. Many white settlers in Hawaii were the kids and grandkids of American missionaries, some of whom became prominent members of the royal court and government. There was also no denying the fact that many of the white settlers were incredibly successful, financially speaking. The U.S. Civil War had provided a huge boost to the Hawaiian economy. With the North cut off from its traditional sugar suppliers in the South, they turned to Hawaii, 
and the planters made a fortune. So, to sum all this up, we have an increasingly prosperous white merchant class who control resources like land and water, as well as publicity vehicles like newspapers. We have a declining population of Native Hawaiians due to infertility and disease. And we have the royal family stuck in the middle of all of this. And one of the men determined to preserve not only the Hawaiian culture, but the entire Hawaiian race was Ke'iulani's uncle, King Kalaka. But the king didn't inherit his throne the old-fashioned way. The previous king, William Lunalilo, had died in 1874 without naming an heir. He preferred the next ruler to be chosen by an election, as spelled out in the constitution. The two ali'i who put their names forward were Kalakaua and Dowager Queen Emma, widow of King Kamehameha IV. Kalakaua won thanks largely to the support of rich white planters. They weren't fans, but they thought he was a pushover, someone they could control. They needed him to resurrect the stalled reciprocity treaty with the U.S., which would let their Hawaiian sugar enter the U.S. without additional taxes. That treaty did get passed. However, the U.S. Senate added an amendment, a sort of diplomatic first dibs, it forced the king to guarantee that he wouldn't lease or grant any Hawaiian land to any other nation. It made the white planters happy, but native Hawaiians could read between the lines. America had just put its foot through their door. How likely was it that a foot was all they wanted? But the king had other problems to solve. Ke'iulani's family didn't have a lot of money. The king and his siblings were all land rich, but cash poor. So in 1880, the legislature voted to pay them salaries for the first time, but the king spent money like water. And when he ran out, he borrowed money from one of the most powerful sugar barons, Claus Spreckles. When word got around that the king owed Spreckles millions, everyone assumed it meant Spreckles was running the government. This begs the question, what did the king do with all the money he borrowed? In 1879, he almost bankrupted the treasury to rebuild Iolani Palace. The legislature approved $50,000 for the renovation, but the final cost was roughly $350,000, which, if you've ever seen an HGTV renovation show, seems par for the course. In 1881, he took a trip around the world, becoming the first monarch to personally circumnavigate the globe. In New Jersey, he met Thomas Edison and asked the inventor to help Hawaii modernize with electricity. From Vienna, he wrote home about how wonderful Johann Strauss's band was, calling the music, quote, the best I have ever heard. And when he met Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle, he said, quote, I was quite electrified and monopolized the whole of the conversation. Six-year-old Ke'iulani had actually written to him and asked him to bring her a diamond ring. The king replied to Lili'u and said he would, quote, bring her a much more valuable present than a diamond ring. I don't know for sure what he had in mind, but I can take an educated guess. While in Japan, he had a meeting with the emperor, Mutsuhito. He suggested an engagement between Ke'iulani and the 15-year-old Prince Yamashina Sadamaro. The engagement would have created a much closer relationship between the two countries, and that's probably exactly what the king was after. The emperor didn't say yes, but he didn't say no either. It took almost a year for the Japanese response. The prince wrote a very polite note to say thanks, but when he asked his dad, he found out he was already betrothed. But the specter of a Japanese engagement lingered. We'll see this come up again later, at a time when Ke'iulani least wanted it to. When the king got home, he had a good idea of how royalty in other countries lived, so he set out to make sure the Hawaiian monarchy was on the same page. He had never had a coronation, so he scheduled one for February 12, 1883, to be held at Iolani Palace. Incidentally, the world's first royal palace with electricity, thanks to the king's visit to Thomas Edison. Seven-year-old Ke'iolani was there when King Kalakaua crowned himself. This wasn't a flex like it had been when Napoleon did it. 
it was more like a compromise. He had told his sister Liliu that it was the only way to keep the peace between all the people who thought they should get to do the honors. But when it came time for the king to crown his wife, Kapi'alani, there was a problem. Her hairdo was too big, and the crown, which you can see in this picture, wouldn't fit. After his first try failed, her ladies-in-waiting had to come unhook her veil, diamond tiara, hairpins, and a comb from her hair. He tried again, and still the crown wouldn't fit. This time, he shoved it down until it stayed put. Those nearby said they saw Kapi'alani wince. This was the only royal coronation held on what would become American soil. And although it was a glamorous event, it didn't achieve the unity the king had hoped for. The legislature had approved $10,000, but the coronation cost more than $30,000. To the Americans, any money spent on a monarchy was wasted. After all, America had fought a revolution to get out from under a monarchy. In their opinion, the only good government was a republic. Plus, they preferred the money be spent on roads, railroads, and transportation to help them get their sugar to market faster. In addition to his spending, the king was involved in some sketchy financial transactions. These included hush-hush land leases, the sale of political offices, and a case of double dipping when he sold an opium license twice and refused to return the second buyer's money. This is not the kind of honest and upright stuff you want from your king, no matter how good a musician he is, or how good his intentions, or how much fun he is at parties. And eventually, it all started catching up with him. Two of the king's most vocal opponents were Lauren Thurston, whom we briefly met, and Sanford Dole, both whites born in Hawaii to American missionaries. Dole and Thurston created a new political party called the Independents, targeting the king and Spreckles. They were for anything that made them more money and against anything that made them less. They were especially against any money spent on the monarchy, which they saw as pointless. In 1887, the Reciprocity Treaty came up for renewal. The U.S. asked to include a provision that allowed them to lease Pearl Harbor as a repair and refueling station for the Navy. The white planters were all for it. Needless to say, Native Hawaiians and the royal family were not. But Hawaii's entire economy was bound up in the sugar trade, and that sugar trade depended on preferential treatment from U.S. importers. So for the time being, the king felt he had no choice. He gave the U.S. what they wanted to keep the economy humming. When the court painter's wife asked him why the independents were hassling him so much, he told her, quote, It is not me personally at all. What they want is my country. And that's where we're going to leave Ka'iulani and her family, in the midst of a struggle for the land, the resources, and the very soul of Hawaii. Check out video two in my series on Ka'iulani to continue the story. We're about to see one part of her mother Like Like's deathbed predictions come true. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment, like, or subscribe. Before recording, I watched a lot of videos, listened to a lot of podcasts, and made an audio supercut cheat sheet of pronunciations from Hawaiian speakers. Still, it's not the same thing as being able to speak the language properly, and I apologize for anything I got wrong. For more fascinating stories about royal women, check out my website at girlinthetiara.com and sign up for my mailing list. I put links for both of them in the description. You can also support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. That support helps pay for books and research subscriptions to help me track down more information on little-known royal women. There's a post there now with lots of tidbits about Queen Kapi'alani and Princess Liliuokalani's trip to Queen Victoria's Jubilee in 1887 that you might be interested in. To all my patrons who are watching, thank you so much. Your support helps keep this site and this channel going. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time.